שלום, ברוכים הבאים. סתם, אני נורא אוהב לעשות אותם. מהימני או איפה אני? אני רציתי להיות גיים שואו הוסט, אבל לא יצא, אז נדפקת מדי פה. אמרו לי שיש לי שקופיות, אז הקליקר אמור להיות פה איפשהו. אל תדאגו, יש לי בסך הכל שתי שקופיות. אז לא, לא נדפקתם, אני לא מעביר את ההרצאה, כי אם אני הייתי מעביר את ההרצאה זה לא ממש בלוקצ'יין אקדמי, יותר בלוקצ'יין זו, אולי. טוב, אז אני בינתיים אתחיל לדבר עד שהם תגידו דברים. ברוכים הבאים לאירוע השני של בלוקצ'יין אקדמי. אז כמו שכתוב פה, כי אני יותר טוב בלקרוא מאשר בלהלדל, אז the community for technologies looking to learn more about crypto and blockchain technology. שזה לא מאוד מרקטיאלי, אבל זה נכון. אני רואי בן יוסף מסמסונג נקסט, אנחנו שותפים ליצירת הקהילה הזו וההוסט של הדבר הזה. למי שמכם שלא שמעתי, אומר את המשפט הזה אי פעם, וסמסונג נקסט הם קרן השקעות ותודה לה שהגעתם בערב הקצת מבהיל הזה. מזל שהבאנו מהנדס בניין שיוודא את הרבה יותר לפני, כי אחרת הייתי מפחד לעמוד פה. באופן עקרוני, כמו שאמרתי, סמסונג נקסט זה קרן השקעות, אנחנו מחפשים למשל להשקיע בסטארט-אפים של נון קריפטו בלוקצ'יין, אבל זה לא הפואנטה, אתם פה תחת הכובע השני שלי. שזה אקוסיסטם ריליישנס מנג'ר, שאנחנו מנסים ליצור פעילויות שיעזרו לאקוסיסטם המקומי No Spring the Patch, כלומר זה לא שאנחנו מנסים למכור פה משהו, א', כי אנחנו מוכרים כסף, כסף זה דבר נורא קל למכור. כסף. אז מספיק עליי ועל סמסונג נקסט. אז זה האירוע השני. למי שמכם שצריך וי-פיי, אני לא יודע למה זו השקופית שאחרי זה, אבל זה הוי-פיי. אתה יכול לחזור לזה. אז בסוף האירוע הקודם, שהאירוע הראשון שלנו, הכרזנו על תחרות. תחרות הייתה מוצלחת במיוחד, קיבלנו הרבה מאוד סאבמשנס. תחרות ביקשה מכם להציע הצעות כדי לשפר את הבלוקצ'יין באופן כללי. ואני רוצה להכריז על הזוכים באופן חד משמעי ומאוד מאוד מאוד דרמטי. אז לא כל כך. האנשים האלה זכו. אז יש לנו את עומר גולדברג במקום הראשון. אין לכם מה להגיע לפה, זה לא שזה. סרגי אילבסקי, אני מקווה ש... במקום השני, הוא נמצא שם, הוא נמצא בבית, ליד לב, שאותו אני מכיר איזושהי סיבה. ואלבר אש ושחר זוהר במקום השלישי. ההצעות שלהם היו פה, והוא אומר לכם משהו על נפלא. מגיעים לכם, מגיעים לכם פרסים, כן, שכחתי את הדברים, אז תודה רבה. ועכשיו... לאירוע המרכזי, אני רוצה uh, להציג בפניכם את uh, האירוע שלנו, זה How to become a smart contract engineer by עודד נועם. עודד נועם הוא הבן אדם הנפלא פה על עצמכם, שהוא קצת יותר יסביר על, על עצמו ברגע שהוא יתחיל, אז uh, תהנו. Awesome, but why it's so uh, complicated to, to create them. 
Uh, and we're going to try and draw some principles uh, that apply to anybody who wants to, to be a developer of, a, of smart contracts. Um, a little bit about me. My name is uh, Ben Ma. Uh, I've been a software developer for a uh, very long time, well, since about 1992. I've been doing this professionally from about 1994. Um, and uh, in the, since 2016, or less, uh, I've been consulting businesses uh, that are uh, using blockchain um, as part of their uh, uh, operation. Uh, and, um, uh, more recently, I've been uh, holding two positions. I'm the uh, head of blockchain research at uh, Kin. Kin is the uh, um, ecosystem for uh, digital life services that uh, Kik Interactive <coughs> launched about uh, four months ago. And it is today the um, most deployed, I think, uh, mass market crypto wallet and uh, it is going to be a very significant force in the uh, crypto world as we, uh, uh, as we see it. Uh, I also uh, hold the position of uh, the chief architect of Orbs. Orbs is uh, a company that uh, develops a next generation blockchain platform uh, aimed at mass market applications such as Kim. So uh, I work at both positions. There's a very close collaboration between Keen and Orbs, uh, and uh, uh, that's both companies are doing really awesome stuff in blockchain. So if, if anybody here is interested in uh, uh, working in uh, the best blockchain positions in the world today, they both happen to be here in Savannah. Uh, so we're looking for uh, uh, for people both at Orbs and at so, uh, uh, if anybody is looking for uh, opportunities, you can raise your hand now, or you can come to us later. Um, and uh, you, uh, I'm sure you find the opportunities interesting. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, talking about uh, why smart contracts are so interesting. So. Let's begin with uh, defining, uh, for uh, uh, those of you who are not familiar, what smart contracts are. Uh, so the idea of using computer code as a type of contract dates back about 20 and something years. Uh, it was uh, proposed initially by uh, Nick Sabo uh, in 1994. Uh, for those of you who don't know Nick Sabo, very important cryptographer, and he's absolutely not Satoshi Nakamoto. That's, you should know that. Um, now, in 1994, there wasn't uh, a blockchain yet. Satoshi Nakamoto didn't exist then, of course. So, um, when Sabo designed smart contracts back then, he was thinking about smart contracts running on any regular computer. So. The idea is that uh, instead of uh, writing a contract in plain language or in legal plain language and uh, have lawyers or judges or the parties to the contract execute it, you can write the agreement in code and have the computer execute it. So if the uh, contract refers to uh, digital assets, then the actual execution of the code can actually uh, move the assets, change hands, or whatever needs to be done according to the contract. Uh, so that, that's a very interesting uh, property that smart contracts can enforce themselves. Um, but that's not what's so great about it. Um, let's talk a little bit about the modern uh, way smart contracts are used, and uh, that's what you can find in smart contracts of the blockchain. So, um, for, for what we need, we can uh, refer to a blockchain as a type of replicated state machine. That's technically correct, but what is a uh, replicated state machine? Uh, 
A replicated state machine uh, is basically uh, uh, in distributed systems. It's a system that uh, each computer sees the same system state. And whenever we want to change that state, we just agree on the change and replicate the change between the different computers. So that every computer um, gets the state change, applies it, and gets to the new state. And that way, as long as the changes are always in consensus, the si every, everybody on the system sees the same state. And that's how our distributed systems work everywhere. That's how distributed databases work, distributed file systems, and that's how blockchain works. So that's uh, pretty trivial when we're talking about the distributed ledger. Um, we have the payments ledger. Somebody has a certain amount of money, that's system state. We get to a consensus about a transaction that transfers money from A to B. Once everybody's agreed on the contents of that transaction, then the new system state is where B has the money. Um, so that's how Bitcoin works, for example. That's how all cryptocurrencies work. Uh, but with smart contracts, we can do something that's a bit more elaborate. We can run any code on a Turing complete machine. And, uh, that means any computer code. And we can get to a consensus over its output. So that's basically a smart contract. We can write our contract in computer code and use the decentralized uh, system that's called the blockchain to agree on the outputs of our contract. Because that's in consensus, we can rely, we can agree on, on the outputs of the contract. So that may not sound like much, but it is. Because uh, what it provides us is completely decentralized backend for applications. And decentralized is really uh, a huge concept. Why is it so? So I'll start with something that's completely unrelated. The internet. The internet is great. And I maintain that the reason the internet is great is because of decentralization. So uh, we know that the internet is decentralized. Nobody controls it. Nobody can take it down. Nobody's in charge of it. Uh, and. Um, even though the people who initially developed the internet, the people who got it, got it to uh, where it is today, even though many of them are not around, it still keeps on evolving, the internet gets better and better, it keeps on changing, and it keeps being awesome and, uh, and, and awesome. And it has kittens. So, the internet is a type of DAO a decentralized autonomous organization. So if you try to generalize why the internet is so great, the internet is an organization. There's ways that the internet operates, there's procedures of how it uh, can do things, there's procedures of how the internet can modify itself, how it can uh, adopt uh, improvements or uh, get better. Um, and although it has all this, nobody controls it. There's no uh, person or, or group of people that, uh, without, that without them the internet would not exist or would not be able to improve. Um, and it, it just works. It, get, it, it operates really well. It uh, adopts changes. It improves. It evolves. That's all we accept from a success, all we expect from a successful organization. And uh, decentralized organizations, they tend to be very robust. They tend to be more fair because nobody controls them. Nobody can uh, abuse them for their own good. They're very democratic, not always, but in many cases. Uh, and they have the potential of being disruptive in many industries because many industries have some people in power who are uh, at a risk of uh, being corrupt and of uh, abusing the organization for their own good. And 
decentralized organization, they don't have it. They, uh, they are more likely to act for the benefit of, of, of the, uh, uh, their entire user base or the uh, entire universe, for that matter. So DAOs are uh, really great. There's a small issue with DAOs is that it's a whole new form of organization. It's something that didn't exist. If you try to think about it, all the other types of organizations that we see are hundreds of years old. I mean, we have companies and we have uh, foundations and we have nation states and we have churches and they've all existed for at least three, four hundred years and some of them much more than that. But decentralized organizations, it's a new type of organ and it doesn't fit a lot of the uh, a lot of the existing definitions. So, for example, a decentralized organization has no territory. Um, it doesn't exist anywhere. It does. It's not clear what uh, legal framework it should apply to. And a lot of issues that uh, the real world um, society has learned to cope with uh, when it comes to dealing with companies or dealing with churches or dealing with nation states, they, these frameworks don't always exist when it comes to decentralized organizations. So let's agree that decentralized organizations are a good thing. What do we do if we want to create a decentralized organization? Or, so the building block for decentralized organizations are decentralized apps. Uh, we can think of a lot of examples to decentralized apps. For example, email is a decentralized app, nobody controls it. It just relays mail from server to server. The World Wide Web is such. They both operate over the internet, though email can also operate on other networks. Um, so these are all decentralized applications. Now, if I want to, to develop a new decentralized applications, I have a very uh, difficult challenge to, to solve. Uh, because I need to get enough people to use my uh, protocol, I need to propose a protocol and get enough people to use it, and until I do that, that protocol would just not do anything, it would not be valuable to anybody. Because you have that critical mass that before you reach it, the network doesn't have any value. That's, that's a big problem when we're trying to create decentralized apps. Um, oh, sorry. So, uh, here comes smart contracts. Once we have a protocol for smart contracts and we have a blockchain that can execute smart contracts in a decentralized fashion, uh, as once we have that, then that blockchain has the critical mass that it needs to operate, now I can very simply, by deploying my code as a smart contracts to that network, I can, I can create a decentralized app. I mean, my app is installed on the blockchain and it operates. It has the critical mass it needs to operate. And it brings value to its users. So it, in a way, it helped me circumvent the problem of reaching the critical mass. So here's a, an example of a trivial use case for a smart contract. Because I've been talking about uh, some big concepts. So let's go down to Earth. Uh, a very simple smart contract of an escrow to uh, exchange assets. So exchanging assets is something that requires a level of trust. And I met somebody on the internet, I told them I want to sell you my crypto kitties, bring me money. So we need to trust each other because somebody needs to go first and send their valuable asset, trusting that the other will send their asset. Now, the alternative is to use an escrow service. So we could go to a lawyer which we both trust, pay him something and uh, have him do the exchange. Or we could use a decentralized application uh, as smart contracts for doing that exchange. So 
I write the code for smart contracts that knows that it's supposed to get one cryptophily, one ether, and then once both these conditions are met, the buyer would get uh, the kitty and the seller would get the ether. So that's very simple. And it's, well, I know I promised there wouldn't be any code, but that just to illustrate that it's not a lot of code, it's really a simple contract and it does that simple task of exchanging assets. So it sounds very simple. We know how to write software, now we know how to write smart contracts. Awesome. Let's start creating decentralized applications. Now the problem is that writing smart contracts isn't exactly like writing software. So uh, one thing that's very different between regular software and smart contracts is that smart contracts have um, have a different use than software. We write software because we want to execute it and see it out. We write smart contracts because we want somebody else to agree with us on the contents of the code itself. So in a way, when I'm going to write code, uh, what I'm trying to do is convert the mental model that I have of what my software needs to do with a piece of code. But when I'm writing a smart contract, there's, uh, there's another process where I need to convert, uh, translate my mental model to code, but that code the code needs to be uh, translated to the mental model of the person reading the code. And that's the important part. I mean, executing the contract is secondary to having somebody agree to sign the contract. So that, of course, means that we need to write good code. Um, it means that we need to write our code openly, we need to be open source, or at least share the code with whoever we're uh, signing the contract with. Um, and we need to provide tools that would help the reader understand what the code does. So I'll talk a little bit later about tests and, inform and, and about formal verifications, but it's important to give whatever tools people need to understand the code. The code by itself is not always enough. Another interesting property of smart contracts is that they need to be immutable. At least in today's uh, smart contracts, the code itself needs to be immutable. And the reason is very clear. Uh, uh, you wouldn't agree to sign a legal contract if you know that the document itself could change. Right? Because whoever wrote the contract could change it after the, your signature. You, you wouldn't write an empty page and uh, let the lawyer uh, draft the contract later. Maybe you would, but it would be a smart thing to do. Uh, now, if our code is immutable, if we need to write it once and for the code to be final, then we need to start with the final version of our code. But can we write the final version of our code to begin with? I mean, as software engineers, we have very bad reputation for being able to do things right the first time. Um, uh, when, when I was uh, just starting out some 20-something years ago, somebody told me that um, every, uh, every source file has at least one more bug. And that's always true. So just think how that applies to smart contracts. All smart contracts must have another bug. Another um, very um, problematic aspect of smart contracts compared to, uh, to regular plain language contracts is that there's no code that can overrule them, or there's almost no code that can overrule them. So um, suppose, well, I'll, I'll tell you something. Uh, we know that software engineers write bugs. But you should know that lawyers also have bugs. 
And there's always an edge case that nobody thought of, and sometimes in life you, you get to that case and uh, uh, you find yourself in some weird situation where the contract just says something that you didn't intend when you signed the contract. So uh, that also happens with real world contracts. Uh, but in real world contracts, if the results of the contract are uh, absurd, then first of all, maybe the sides that signed the contracts could agree between themselves that the result is absurd and not execute the contract, and it's okay. Or if one of them wants to execute the absurd contract and another doesn't, then they can always try to appeal. They can uh, go to a court of law and try to have the contract of rule. Uh, so that's possible. I mean, a judge could say that contract technically says something, but that doesn't make any sense, so we'll overrule the contract. And a court would, uh, would actually try to estimate what was the intent of the people who signed the contract and try to, to make their ruling accordingly. And with computer code, that just, just doesn't happen. We have the inter interpreter, and whatever the code says, if the, if the code has some weird, absurd bugs, then that's a contract. Now, of course, in extreme cases, when we have a bug in the code and that bug could cause damage of hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe we can have a consensus uh, of the entire community that operates the smart contract that uh, we should undo the results of uh, running that contract. That, that's possible. Uh, it actually happened, uh, for example, in Ethereum um, a few years ago, just uh, um, about a year after Ethereum was launched, uh, there was a very, um, a very interesting uh, proposition, actually the largest ICO to date back then, they wouldn't be uh, considered that large. Um, it was called the DAO, and uh, the concept was very simple. It was uh, a DAO that runs a venture fund. That's actually a very nice concept. It's a venture fund without managing partners. So anybody could send their money and invest in the fund, and the fund would choose its investments by getting to consensus uh, with the stakeholders. Very interesting concept. It raises a lot of uh, legal and ethical problems and, uh, um, and uh, could be very interesting uh, test case, only that test case never got to be tested because there was a bug in the DAO code and uh, uh, the, out of the $150 million that they raised, about 70 million were stolen. And because it was by far the largest activity in Ethereum uh, at the time, the Ethereum community decided to change the Ethereum code and undo the, uh, the transactions of the DAO. So technically that's very complicated, of course, because you need to figure out what to do with all the transactions and the following transactions that rely on them and everything. Uh, but that's also very controversial from the uh, smart contracts point of view. Because we had a contract. I mean, the thief, he didn't actually steal funds. He just abused the feature of the contract, which only he noticed. So is he a thief or did he just use the contract as it was designed? Uh, that's. A very big discussion that's uh, very controversial, of course. Uh, actually, for those of you who don't know, uh, the Ethereum network forked on, on that occasion. So today we have two Ethereums. We have Ethereum Classic, where the uh, thieves of the DAO still have their money. And we have Ethereum where they don't. So, uh, that's the Another big challenge with uh, smart contracts is uh, 
is keeping them secure. So of course, I mean, we're among engineers. We know that uh, we know how to write secure code, and everything's okay, and it's going to be okay. Just trust me. Uh, but so, suppose your code is public. It's on the blockchain. Everybody can read it, and it holds millions or tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Then even if your code is just as secure as uh, you usually code, it makes you a huge target uh, for a theft. I mean, basically, if your contract holds millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, then uh, people will try to hack it. And if there's any way they can steal your money, eventually they will. But it's not only about the target. So um, suppose my code is bug free and you can hack the money out of it. But as the person who deployed the code, or as the person who controls it, I retained uh, the uh, permission to change the code or to, uh, to make modifications to it. So somewhere in my home, uh, in the back of the, uh, uh, of the socks drawer, I have the private key that I can use to change that contract. Well, now I'm a huge target. And for hundreds of millions of dollars, um, people will will be very uh, uh, assertive when they're trying to get that private key uh, uh, off of me. So they break into my house if that's required. They might kidnap my children, um, and they can do a lot of awful things. So a part of being secure is not to retain any special rights because that's really dangerous. And there's also the issue of liability. So, uh, as many of you probably know, uh, a main reason to use decentralized systems is that it um, disperses the liability in some way, in some magical way. Decentralized systems are not subject to a lot of uh, regulation and uh, don't have legal liability uh, in, in many cases where uh, centralized services do have. So for example, uh, if, um, if Amazon was down and my service was on Amazon, I could try to sue them for my damages. But if I was using a blockchain platform from my backend and it was down, I cannot sue the miners. They're not liable. So uh, the lack of liability is a, a good reason that many people choose to use blockchain platforms. But notice that the platform is decentralized, that doesn't necessarily mean that your smart contract is decentralized. Because if your smart contract can be controlled with your private key, that means you're in control of that contract. So it's not decentralized, it is centrally controlled. So that could make you liable. So. Although there's no liability on the infrastructure, you need to make sure when you're writing the contract that you design it in such a way that it doesn't create liability for you, unless you intend to. Uh, and again, don't give yourself special rights. So before we said don't give yourself special rights, if you don't. We said don't give yourself special rights because you don't want to be uh, hacked or you don't want to be kidnapped, but you don't also want to uh, appear in court or before Congress or any other situation uh, where you're uh, responsible for other people's money. So in a way, uh, when you're a smart contracts engineer, you also need to be a security expert and a lawyer. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about a few principles for designing and engineering smart contracts. So the first 
it, uh, it's, it may sound trivial, but it's something that um, software uh, engineers are really reluctant to do, and that is to uh, do their work well. Uh, so uh, that means you need to put attention to what you do, you need to design and get to the best design you can before you deploy your uh, uh, immutable contract. You need to write high quality code, uh, you need to test it very well, you need to have unit test integration tests, you need to uh, check that you have proper coverage for your tests. Um, there's uh, the uh, uh, methodology of test-driven development, uh, which covers all these issues, uh, really recommended uh, as a way of working, as the single way you should work when you're designing smart contracts. Uh, you should also use as much as possible sanity checks. Uh, when we're talking about sanity checks, uh, that means that uh, everywhere you can in your code, if you have an assumption in your head, that assumption should appear in code. And uh, I'll give an example from uh, Solidity uh, development. Solidity is the language uh, that's used for developing smart contracts on Ethereum. Uh, Solidity provides uh, two types of uh, sanity checks. Uh, it provides revert and assert, uh, or require and assert. Uh, require verifies that the input that your contract got is sane. So if you got insane input, you should revert, you should abort the transaction and not run the contract. And there's also a set. A set means that the code is insane. So if there's a certain point in the code that shouldn't get, that, that a certain condition that should never be met, or in a certain state, it doesn't make any sense, then that should be an assertion, and that assertion should appear in your code. So, sanity checks allow your code to, to test itself in a way. You should also make good use and very frequent use uh, for uh, code reviews and for professional audits. Now, I mentioned formal verification. Um, so, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept, when we're writing code, uh, usually what our code does is whatever we want it to do. Now, uh, with formal verifications, we're writing computer code that actually describes what our code does rather than how to do that. So it's not the algorithm for making the change, but rather defining uh, what should be uh, the relation of our input, inputs uh, to, the, to the output. So that's a way to describe actually um, the, uh, what we expect from the interface. So in many senses, the formal verifications are uh, the contract part of the code. Only that the uh, whole framework of formal verifications is in very initial stages, it's not developed yet uh, to, to a sufficient state, so it's very hard to use formal verifications today. Not everything is covered in current technologies by formal verifications, and it's very complex to use them. Uh, there's, I wrote, I don't need to copy that, the uh, uh, slides would be on the slide share. Uh, but you can see the state of the development of formal verification tools for Ethereum on that link. Um, I'd also want to comment that formal verifications are not a silver bullet. They don't solve anything. Like unit tests, formal verifications only test for what the developer thought of testing. So there's a lot of things that may not be covered by the formal verifications. Um, I have a, a little example, I, I'm not going to explain exactly how it works or what it does, but just to show you how formal verifications look, uh, this is a part of uh, Ethereum code, and it uses formal verifications to verify that the function for binary search actually uh, does binary search. So it, has, it 
proves that if uh, the input is sorted as it is required by a search, then the result will be the correct result. Uh, so the question is whether this code proves that it runs at the required complexi complexity, and this code doesn't. Uh, theoretically, it's, it should be possible to write uh, a form of verifications that prove that. So um, I'm not saying that everybody should learn how to use form of verification tools and use them. I think it's recommended to a lot of people, but uh, it's really hard in today's uh, frameworks to do that. Uh, there are, though, a few um, a few features of the formal verifications framework that are already making their way into the Solidity compiler. So I'm going to give you one example. Uh, with the newer versions of the compiler, uh, the compiler can make proofs on whether assertions are reachable. So that's, uh, I gave a very trivial uh, and, and silly example, but here I have two, exam two assertions in my code. Uh, one would always be true, and that's okay, assertions need to always be true, but another one could be false. So the second assertion asserts that uh, one is equal to two, and sometimes that's not true. So what we'd expect to happen with the sessions is that this code, when I deploy it to the blockchain and I execute it, then the assertion would fail and an exception would be thrown and uh, I'd lose my guess and a lot of other stuff, but it, it would test this, the sanity of my, uh, of my program and that's excellent. But the new features, uh, which are the SMT checker, that's available from uh, uh, the newer versions of Solidity, would also be able to prove that this condition could occur and do the, um, uh, prove this at compile time. So actually this is what happens when I try to compile it, the compilation fails. So that's pretty awesome, because I uh, discovered something that's, um, that's a bug in my code, and I discovered it at compile time rather than at runtime. So that's very that's very useful. And hopefully, pretty soon, uh, the formal verifications, mo more features relating to formal verifications, will make their way to to the standard uh, compiler. Another principle, which uh, which is always true, but uh, uh, much more true with the smart contracts is to make a real effort at keeping our code short and simple. Um, basically, whatever doesn't need to be uh, part of the contract, part of the agreement, doesn't need to be on, uh, on the blockchain, doesn't need to be a part of the smart contract. So a lot of times we have, the smart contract doesn't need by itself, we have our, our application. And our application has a front end and it has its back end and it has the smart contracts that it uses. So we use the smart contract only for the parts that need to be in consensus. But whatever doesn't need to be in consensus can remain in our back end or front end code. Uh, so one thing is to avoid the optimizations. Don't try to write super efficient code. You should optimize your code. You should write efficient code. You should compile with an optimizer. You should test your code with an optimizer. It's not trivial. Not all, not all bugs uh, come up when you uh, when you run your tests with un unoptimized code. Uh, but you should also try to keep a lot of the code that you're using out of the blockchain. So, um, so if we are using off-chain logic, if we are using some of the logic in our web, uh, in our web app, and only verify that uh, the contents of the contracts um, are 
as they need to be on chain, then we sometimes need to verify the correctness of what we did uh, off chain in the contract. So that's also um, a practice that you need to use. Uh, I'll give you a demonstration. You don't need to understand this code. I'm just um, going to show you something, something very simple. Uh, we have here two implementations of, uh, the, of a function that calculates the square root of an integer. For some reason, I have a smart contract that needs to calculate the square root of a number. Now, the code that you see uh, on, on the left-hand side does that. It calculates the square root. Believe me. But you shouldn't believe me, because it's really, it's not that simple. And it takes a leap of faith to know that uh, the output of that code is actually a square root. Now, instead of that, I could use the code on the right, which also calculates the square root. So what that code, code does, it takes an extra parameter with a hint to what the result should be. That sounds silly. But all it needs to do now is to verify that the number that we got as a hint is in fact the square root of the number that we need to calculate square root of. So that doesn't need, seem to make a lot of sense. But remember that this contract comes hand in hand with a backend code that has math libraries and can very simply calculate square roots. So I don't need to implement my own version of square root. So actually using the silly square root is, makes a lot of sense in this case. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the question is whether it's like using uh, lookup tables in, uh, uh, in embedded programming. So yeah, uh, that's, uh, it's pretty much the same. And uh, of course, if you're relying on lookup tables in your code, then uh, I guess the lookup tables are hard coded into the contract if they're stored in, in, the, uh, in the platform storage. Then you need to, to uh, verify that the uh, whatever is stored there is good. Uh, another interesting property of uh, smart contracts that you need to, to be aware of is that there are no secrets on blockchain. If you have a random C, you have uh, uh, some code that you don't want people to uh, to know in advance what it's going to uh, resolve. Then you have a problem because anybody can see your code, anybody can see the contents of your memory, anybody can simulate the outputs of your code, and everybody can debug them and, and see what happens uh, inside the machine. Uh, well, this. A lot of code for, uh, for a lecture that wasn't supposed to have code. But what I have here, and I'm really not expecting you to read the contents, uh, the, the, the font is too small for me to read. Uh, but that's a famous example. A few months after Ethereum was released, somebody uh, posted on Reddit, uh, here's a contract for playing tic tac oh, not tic tac -tac, that's for playing, um, uh, yeah, uh, Rock, rock, paper, scissors on blockchain on money. How cool is that? Well, it, it is cool. You can uh, bet somebody that you're going to win. And uh, uh, they uh, vote for whatever they're going to pay. And then it's your turn. And then you can check the blockchain and see what they pay. So, no secrets of blockchain. Uh, and uh, last but certainly not least is to write a secure code. So uh, there needs to be a methodology for writing secure code. First of all, you need to uh, do a risk assessment. Try to understand how are people going to attack your code. What parts of the code should be better protected? 
you should audit your code. Internally and externally, you should use good auditing services. Uh, we've been, uh, in my company, we've been involved in many ICOs in the past year. Uh, we've been using very expensive and very professional uh, services that audit code because it uh, you should work with several, you should get recommendations on what auditing services are good, which ones are useful, because they're not all good. You should also make sure that you're updated with, uh, uh, with the industry on security risks. Sometimes new risks are discovered, not, not always everybody are aware of whatever attacks are possible. Uh, you should be in touch uh, with your community. You should continue reviewing your code as long as it's live. You should continue auditing it and making sure it's secure if you find out that some new exploit is applicable to your code. Make sure your users know that. Be transparent about it. I'd rather that they hear it from you than uh, that they hear it once they want to it. Also, if your code is uh, high profile, if it's an ICO or something and you're getting a lot of traffic, uh, have bug bounties. I mean, a lot of people think that with open source software, uh, whatever bugs you have, uh, people are going to discover them. Well, I tell you something, people are not going to look for bugs in your code unless you pay them. So a bug bounty program is a good way to do that. If somebody finds a security, uh, uh, security problem in, in your code, they should be paid for it. And another thing is you can uh, also open your code for, uh, for some sorts of maintenance. So you can have updatable contracts, of course that's a problem, that also that both creates a liability and uh, it, it's a risk to the uh, immutability of your code. But you can have parts of the code upgradable. You can use upgradability in several ways. Of course, you should need, use it cautiously uh, so that you don't create any liability and you don't risk uh, anybody's money. I'm going to make it. It's okay. It's okay, I'm going to make it. Another technique which is uh, uh, a lot of times more useful than available code is just to have a circuit breaker. So just enable your code to, uh, to disable so that if there's a known uh, security hazard in your code, you're not able to change your code because that would create a, a big risk or a liability. But you'd be able to disable your code so that everybody can get their money back and switch to a new, safer version. We recommend a circuit breaker. Uh, a lot of times uh, I recommend using uh, time locks or uh, uh, transaction throttling in, uh, in combination with circuit breakers so that if there's a bug found, then uh, whoever's stealing money won't be able to steal all of it by the time you've uh, touched the circuit breaker. And keep monitoring your code. If there's monitors you can use off-chain that will uh, monitor the state of the contract, the amount of money in it, see if anybody's stealing money off of it, so that you can detect that right away, do that. Have an operation center, have a, uh, an incident response team in, in place. That's it. Um, for those of you who want to read some more, uh, here's a few links with some good reading on the subject. Uh, of course, uh, it's all very, uh, the, the whole industry in a very preliminary state, so uh, it's a practice that still develops. Any contributions would also be welcome. So, thank you. Any questions? Slides are going to be on slideshow. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. 
Hi, I have a question about um, smart contracts. And you said that everyone can see the contents of the smart contract in your code once it's updated. Since you control like the composition of the contract, can you like upload a contract where you encrypt the contents and only people with the right keys can read what's inside? Yeah. You just have it stored on the blockchain? You can do that. Oh well, you know, encrypted code uh, encrypted code is a big challenge. But basically you can well, the interpreter needs to be able to interpret the code. So if the interpreter knows what to do with the code, then a person could theoretically do that. But you can obfuscate the code. You can make it harder to read, harder to debug. Uh, people are doing that. That's that's basic anti-cracking uh, that, that people use in, uh, in regular software, uh, where they don't want the, the code to be reverse engineered. That, that is possible. You can also use cryptographic techniques where the code doesn't actually run on the blockchain, but rather runs on personal computers. But you have blockchain code that verifies the execution of off-chain code. So that way you uh, you don't open your code at all, but you just uh, um, have uh, proven outputs of code run off-chain, and this and the smart contract on-chain can verify that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, Two questions. One uh, in the square root example you had, uh, and I was wondering why the compiler, why the why recent version of uh, Sol C would even compile it since you used a cell rather than a, a cell rather than require when you uh, in the right in the right side. Uh, so can you can you get back to the slide for a second? So uh, you see, you use the uh, you use the cell rather than require, and since this assertion can fail, wouldn't the compiler? Uh, I mean, shouldn't the compiler block uh, even compiling this contract? Uh, so that, that's supposed to be the difference between uh, require and assert, right? Well, the the difference between require and assert is not that the uh, the errors necessarily become run, uh, compile time errors. The SMT checker can make them uh, runtime errors. The uh, logical uh, difference between assert and require is that assert points to a bug in the code and require points to a, bo a bug in the input. And I chose to use assert in this case because there is a bug in the code, probably in the backend code. And assert is just uh, about being. Uh, less nice to an attacker, so that they lose their gas. Yes. But you, you could say that require would be just as good in this case. Okay, and, uh, and another question, uh, unrelated to this, but uh, the, when uh, during the key and ICO, when you switch from a Solidin from a Ethereum to a Stellar, which uh, well, it's no longer Turing complete. Did it cause any pro any problems with the previous code you had, and how did you overcome the the issues of a non to complete uh, coding scanner? Well, um, that that's an interesting question uh, in general. Um, so, what happened in uh, Keen is that uh, we had smart contracts doing the ICO, and we plan to have more smart contracts. Um, Later this year, when we launch the Kin Rewards engine, but at the moment, Kin is only used as a currency. So at the moment, there are no smart contracts that, that are in place. The ICO already ended, and the KRV was not yet launched. So in the meantime, we have a window in which we can use Stella, which has a, a sufficient scaling capacity for our needs. Um, um, uh, and it's good enough for now. When we need smart contracts later, we need to find a solution that probably not them. So basically, it's, uh, so basically, you use uh, Stellar just for tokens, uh, just for tokens, and then you will be, and then you are going to change these tokens back to tokens in an ERC twenty when you need to do some more sophisticated. Well, not necessarily ERC20, that depends on whether Ethereum would be uh, good enough for our uh, needs 
by the time we need them. Yes, it really is proven very problematic for an application like uh, Kim. The, today's transaction costs, for example, they're just yeah. unreasonable for, for uh, transactions like the, the one that we, we have in Kim. And uh, for another example, for, um, when we launched uh, one of the first use cases that in the Kik app was in December, and uh, for those of you who remember, yeah, nobody could do anything on Ethereum in December. So, so that's a, a very big problem for an app that has really uses that yeah. something they want to do on the, on the blockchain. So Ethereum is very problematic, and um, we might be looking for uh, for another platform that supports smart contracts when we need it. Any more questions? Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we, we're going to host uh, another event in a bit more than a month. Uh, Leonid is going to, to host the next event. Uh, you, you want to host another event? <laughs> oh, okay, another question. So let me just finish with uh, the next event. Uh, Leonid is going to teach you how to lose millions of, millions of dollars in your Ethereum. A smart contract. Uh, it's been done and it can be done again. So uh, if you want to learn how, uh, please come. Yeah, another question. Uh, in web dev, we usually do a uh, hello world and a to-do list. If somebody's trying to get into the programming facility, what would be the uh, first couple of the projects? Shesh bash, what is uh, yeah, You can start with a uh, hello world. Although it doesn't make sense as a contract, but it doesn't make sense as a program either. It's okay. Uh, like the to-do list of solidity. That's uh, well. I, I hear a lot of uh, ideas here. Um, I say let's uh, let's open it for. Uh, in our Reddit or something. Yeah, and, and, and I, let's do an ICO for ideas to a uh, Hello World project uh, in Sydney. What's that? Yeah, uh, well, actually, uh, that's a good idea. Crypto assets uh, as, as a means of gaming are going to be the, the big thing because we know it was a big hit in December, so now everybody in the world is trying to, uh, to be the only one who's going to launch one in February. So just, I don't know, crypto ferrets or uh, crypto doggies or um, something like that. Anything else? Okay, good night. Let's have some beer. Thank you.